Hi, hi, this is Brian Fraga. I'm uh, for the Forward Reporter, and I'm here with Sheriff Thomas Hodgson of Bristol County. We're going to be talking about immigration policy today. You know, I, I haven't seen you in a while in person, but I have seen you on TV recently speaking with President Trump in the Oval Office as he vetoed that congressional resolutions. And you are on TV uh, speaking of praising the, the President for doing that. So. Tell us why you know you were there and why you supported the president's veto. Well, I've been at a number of roundtables with the president prior to that on this whole issue of immigration, and the reason I have is because I've been working on this issue for 20 years, going back to the days of Henry Hyde and Barney Frank, who worked on a bipartisan bill uh, nearly 20 years ago, and I recall back then uh, when it passed through the House, I. Uh, spoke with Senator Hatch. I went over to uh, Senator Kerry's office and said to Senator Kerry's staff, look, this needs to get through it, made it through the House. And I'll never forget this. The aide, without hesitation, said, that's never going to see the light of day. I said, why not? And she said, because there's an election year uh, coming up, and it'll never see the light of day. And the reason I never forgot that was because it told me at that moment that the politics were more important than the issues that are facing the American people and the impacts those issues are, issues are having on the people I serve and sheriffs across this country serve. And um, so um, I have continued to, to work on this issue for 20 years. And most recently with the Trump administration, the, the president is the first one, the first grown up in the room, frankly, uh, who has taken the bull by the horns, sat down with the experts, the sheriffs, Border Patrol, and others, and really try to understand what is the problem, what's the depth of the problem, what are the recommended solutions, as well as he's taking the time to understand the angel families, the angel moms and dads, people who lost their sons and daughters at the hands of criminal illegal aliens who have come here, talk to people where and understood the issues around gangs that are that are infiltrating our neighborhoods. Uh, we know that MS-13 and the border, the border people will tell you today that the word down there is go to Massachusetts because that's where they're taking over the, the turf because they don't have other rival international gangs in Massachusetts at this point in New England. And this is their chance for MS-13 to grab foothold and, and uh, hold on to the territory here. So, so in my visit to the border just three weeks ago, we were talking about this with the, with the, in McAllen, Texas, about uh, what they're observing and what their knowledge is about this going on up here in Massachusetts and New England. But to my point, Congress has had 20 years to deal with a problem that we continued to testify before their committees on, send them letters, speak to them in person, sheriffs, chiefs, law enforcement, border patrol. We've all been talking to them, saying our communities are getting worse and worse. Right. A common question or criticism I see often raised when giving the news regarding immigration is, what is a county sheriff, the sheriff of Bristol County, why is he so involved on national immigration policy? Why go to the border when your primary responsibility is care and custody of, of uh, detainees and inmates here in Bristol County? What do you say to that? Well, the sheriffs have a broad responsibility, uh, both from a law enforcement standpoint as well as care and custody of people in our prisons and in our House of Correction. I will never apologize for going to Washington. I did it when President Obama was there to work with Homeland Security, with the Under Secretary of Homeland Security on this whole issue of immigration. This is not a partisan issue. The reason I do it is because, number one, when they're establishing policy in Washington, I want to make sure, as do other sheriffs who go to Washington, and other law enforcement partners, that that policy is directed at the problems we're having in our communities. Because we're all border states now. We are all border communities because people all over this country are coming in from the southern border, they're being put on buses, and they're traveling to communities all over Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, and on and on and on. Massachusetts, by the way, is has the sixth highest heroin overdose rate in the United States. We are the second most common place to find fentanyl. 
we know that 90% of those drugs are coming through the border, on the southern border. So that stands to reason that every one of us has a stake in this game, and we need to make sure that if we have somebody like the President of the United States who's willing to be the first one to step up and say, no, public safety is first and foremost the fundamental responsibility of people who are elected to public office, and he will fulfill his obligation to keep people safe. The trafficking of heroin, fentanyl, the marijuana, that's definitely related to border security. But at the same time, I believe I've read that most drugs enter through legal ports of entry. So like, how is that connected to, say, it's a great like question. migrants who <clears throat> come here looking for work? Well, there's, there's, those are two different, two different points about where the, where the drugs come in. The, the drugs, the majority of the drugs that they found, they found at the ports of entry because they have the resources there to check the vehicles coming through and check the different ways of smuggling it. But that isn't, that, that doesn't suggest that the majority of the drugs are coming through those ports of entry. Those are the ones that they've been able to capture in the greater percentages. But we know the, the drugs are flooding over the border where there's no security. And one has nothing to do with, that issue has nothing to do with people who are trying to come here to get jobs. There's a difference between the two. And I think people need to separate that because not everyone that's coming across this border, we know it, the majority aren't necessarily bringing in drugs. Uh, they're, they're coming here because they want to seek a new opportunity to get a job. But we do have laws that are on the books. If we aren't getting or providing enough opportunity and we have the ability to, to, to take in more based on our infrastructure and the opportunities, then Congress needs to change the laws. But they won't. They won't. And so what happens is, meanwhile, they turn a blind eye toward the law and they encourage people to come by making, you know, fighting the president on his attempts to enforce the laws that are on the books because they won't and using court rulings and things to obstruct uh, the efforts to make sure that the laws are complied with until they're changed. <clears throat> now, you said you went to the, the border recently and it, down to McAllen, Texas? Yes, the Rio Grande Valley. The Rio Grande Valley. So what, did, what did you see there? What I saw uh, was as deplorable a situation as I've ever seen, and I've been to the border four times. That was my fourth visit. <clears throat> and what I saw in those processing centers, I turned to other sheriffs that were there with me and said, could you imagine having the magnitude of people standing here, lined up on the walls, kids in group cells just standing there all day long, uh, adults in, in uh, uh, chain link sort of pens so that they border people can see what's going on so there's no violence or somebody's not being victimized. But in, in McAllen, the Rio River Valley, what I saw was a facility that's not meant for holding people, it's meant for processing. I saw border patrol people sitting at their desks processing 24 hours a day. They were processing with masks on to prevent them from getting diseases. <clears throat> we saw, we saw uh, the garage area full of kids and parents laying on the floor with temporary blankets. Um, the facility at Rio Grande Valley is, the capacity for that facility is 1,500. They've got 2,400 in that facility right now. And they only have 35 showers and 41 porta for 2,500 people. Now that's not the Border Patrol's fault. That's not President Trump's fault. That's Congress's fault, because Congress knows this has been going on and getting worse and worse and worse. And every time that we see more and more people being let out into the communities, in Aurora, for example, Colorado, at their holding facility, Congress is aware of this, 256, I believe it is, people are under quarantine. The problem is, under the, under the law, <clears throat> the family, can, a family unit, if I come in with a child as a single parent or a mother, whether it's my child or not, it's considered a family unit. ICE can only hold us for 20 days, and they have to release us. Right, that's, the, that's part of the Flores decision. That's the Flores decision. Right. <clears throat> the problem is, 
I'm in there for 10 days, I contract measles or mumps. Now, they're going to put me on a treatment plan which takes 25 days to go through the treatment plan. The problem is, I'm being released in 10 days. So what are they doing? They're giving me, after my second 10 days, because they have to release me, the other 15 days of medication and instructions on how to use it and sending me out into the communities of America hoping that I'm going to follow those directions and take that medication. That is not looking out for that person to make sure that they can get past that disease and it's certainly not looking after the people in those communities who are going to get exposed if the person doesn't follow along. Right. I mean, there is serious humanitarian type issues and concerns. No but question. Again, I guess someone could still ask, but again, what does that have to do with being the sheriff in Bristol County, Massachusetts? Like, how is that situation in, in those border patrol facilities? Like, the, the, like, how is that connected to public safety in Fall River in New Bedford and Taunton? The way that the reason that that's connected to the public safety in, in New Bedford, Taunton, and so forth is, for example, um, we had a, a we had a, a young mother uh, who was murdered in New Bedford by her father, who had been deported twice, had already done 10 years for um, assault with intent to murder, been released, come back to the country twice, and murdered her daughter because she, she, right here in New Bedford, when she was getting out of the car with her groceries to go into her apartment to see, to, to see her two-year-old daughter. Uh, it, it matters because in the town of Milford in two years, we had three people in Milford who were killed by people who were not supposed to be in this country who were here illegally. And it matters because drugs are pouring into our communities and mothers and fathers are going in to wake their adolescent kids up in the morning because they, they think they overslept, but they're not waking up because they're dying of an overdose. And, <clears throat> and just in Dartmouth the other day, we, we've just been reported, not even a quarter mile from here, they reported now that somebody was here with measles. Do we know if that person was legal or illegal? No, we don't. We do know that a lot of the diseases that we've eradicated are starting to come back and some new ones are coming in as a result of what they're seeing in these processing centers. So, so all of this has to do with the people that I promised to protect and every sheriff in this nation promised to protect. So it has everything to do with my responsibilities if I know our, our communities are at risk, and they are. Uh, you remember probably when Governor Patrick was trying to get more and more people sent to uh, the air base down in, in, in the Cape, yes. saying they were going to be there 30 days and they were going to have a school for them. What kind of school? They are coming from different communities, different, different backgrounds, different languages, different levels of education. Uh, how are you creating a curriculum for someone like that? These are, the, these are the false stories that we're encouraging people to come here with nowhere really to have them go. And when you, when you look at 100,000 people coming into this country illegally in the, in the month of March through the Rio Grande Valley, what's happening is you have, that, in that instance, you have 4,000 more people than the entire population of New Bedford, Massachusetts. And my question is, how many New Bedford, Massachusetts are sitting idle with hospitals, fire departments, police departments, and vacant homes for people for 100,000 people to just move into and have, a, have the complete infrastructure that they need and expect that everything's going to be fine. It's not going to happen. So it affects our quality of life. Uh, it affects our ability to protect the citizens for the percentage of people coming in here that shouldn't be here that are going to commit crimes. Um, all the people who are coming here, even the ones who are getting jobs and using false identifications, false social security numbers, that's a felony under our laws under state law. It's a felony. So, so when I hear people saying, oh, well, people that are coming here illegally commit far less crimes than the people percentage-wise and people who are citizens of this country, is not true. Because the, even the people who didn't go out and commit some crime from the standpoint of victimizing someone else, if they're using a false social security number, someone else's, or a false identity, they've committed a felony. In America, if you do that, you're going to be you're going to be charged and, con and, and likely convicted, and either seriously fined or, or put in jail. So, so why would we create a whole different standard for people who violated our laws instead of saying to Congress, 
You don't like the laws the way they are? You want to have more people come in? Make laws that allow that. But this idea of, of bifurcating our, 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 our system of laws begins to undermine the republic and the ability for people to have equal justice under the law. Thanks, Sean. Now, you've met with and spoken with President Trump a few times now, and we, you know, most of us kind of have our own impressions of him from his Twitter feed, from social media, from the news media. Uh, can you tell, to tell us what your interactions with the president have been like and what kind of man, president, if you found him to be in person? Well, first of all, I've had great, he's, he's a very affable person. Um, he's someone that's very interested in listening and understanding from the people who have their boots on the ground. What are the issues? What are the problems? And I tell you that because um, this isn't about style. It's not about party. It's about whether or not someone is going to assume the mantle of leadership and focus on the people they promised to represent. And he does that. He, he listens to the people who are impacted on various issues. He wants to know the detail. And what's really great about him is he, he's one of these people that you would look at as a phenomenal CEO who knows how to run a company because he wants to understand the problem by the people who are being impacted by it. And then he wants to know what are your recommendations for solutions for. He's all business, but he's also a very, very kind and nice person. He's a very sensitive person. I know people have different impressions about him. They may not like his style, they may not like his personality, but we didn't elect him to, to, to judge him on his personality and whether or not we like his style. We want to know in America once and for all, can we get some people in office that are going to produce results that really matter to us and not have the, the kind of nonsense we've seen for years where it's back and forth between Republicans and Democrats who have turned the legislative branch of our government into a political playground? They're not even interested. They, we have people on the outside of the Capitol saying, hey, we need some help over here, and they're arguing over their partisan politics on both sides of the aisle. And people are getting it. They're starting to understand that these people that we're paying salaries to represent our interests, they're not, they're not interested in us. They're pushing everything through their political filter, figure out what they can capture for themselves on both sides of the aisle. And whatever's left over, well, perhaps you'll get some benefit out of it. But other than that, the most important thing to us is our politics, us getting elected, and us holding on to power. Bottom line. Now, you commended the president for vetoing that resolution. I did. Now, there were, there, there were Democrats and Republicans who, in Congress who raised cons constitutional concerns about the president, in their words, doing an, an end run around Congress because he, didn't, because he couldn't get what he wanted in funding through the normal legislative process and that this was a way for him basically to subvert Congress's power of the press. So, but obviously you didn't quite see it that way, judging by your remarks in the Oval Office. So, sure. your thoughts on that? Well, it's a similar refrain that we've heard from Congress for a long time, even when President Obama was in, when he was issuing executive orders. They were like, hey, he's doing an end around, he's doing an end around. I think what the American people are starting to see, it's becoming more and more clear that Congress is, is the obstacle to people getting government service and results out of the government. Because the presidents are trying to get things done that Congress just want to spend their time arguing back and forth about. And for once, we have somebody who, like his style or not, he's saying, I'm not interested in your politics, it could be Republican or Democrat. I'm looking out for fixing these problems that are right before us and watching people that I promised to protect, like the sheriff's field. I promised, I stood at the Capitol with the angel moms and dads not too long ago, it was probably <clears throat> maybe a month and a half ago, they asked me to speak. And there were about 70 or more angel moms and dads there. And when I, when, I went, when I got up to speak, I said, you know, I'm very sad to be standing here knowing that all of these people behind me will never celebrate a Christmas, never perhaps see a grandchild they might have seen, or wedding, or what have you, for children that were killed by by people who didn't belong here and, um, and, and were in the country illegally. But I'm more sad because I, like every sheriff in this country, promised 
that we'd protect them, and we couldn't. Not because we weren't trying, not because we weren't following the laws, but we had members of Congress who were trying to undermine our relationships with our partners in the federal, state, and local uh, efforts to protect our citizens, who refused time and again for 20 years to address the immigration issue and reform those laws. I'm sad that we couldn't do it, but it isn't really honestly because of us. It's because they are continuing to encourage this kind of thing going on, and they sit in here right behind us in this building and continue focusing on their politics over the people's uh, public safety. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> you describe Congress as an obstacle, but it is still a, a constitutional entity, a reality that the president has to deal with. I mean, one can say that he just can't ignore or or try to undermine Congress, right? Um, is, is, is there a valid constitutional concern there in, in what he did in declaring a national emergency to get the money he wanted? Well, he, it is a national emergency, number one. And those of us who have been on the border know it is. It's a crisis of epic proportions. And we know it. Uh, the, the people that are claiming it's not are the people that haven't gone to the border, won't talk to them, won't, wouldn't listen to Kirsten Nielsen, which was testifying, didn't want to hear from her. Yesterday, when the Border Patrol people were there, the, the committee that was hearing uh, from the Border Patrol on the specifics of how many different nationalities are coming through, percentage increase, the depth of the problem, there are pictures of that committee room with the chairman sitting at the, at, at the, the, uh, in, on the dais and nobody else in the committee meeting. All the members weren't even there to listen while these people were, were pouring out the information in detail about the impacts, and they didn't even care. They weren't even there on both sides. So, so now to the question of the constitutional uh, right of the president to do it, it's my understanding that the president was fully within his constitutional uh, uh, rights to do that, uh, and w within the, const the the law set forth in the Constitution to to declare the emergency. And even in the Oval Office at that time that the President was signing it, the Attorney General reiterated that, said the President had absolute authority to veto this and to declare the, the national emergency. So I suppose it depends who you're listening to, but you have the Attorney General who's, who's uh, obviously making a public statement about the law and saying that the President's within his authority. Yeah. I mean, like, there have been recent increases in unaccompanied minors and entire family units c c like coming from Central America <coughs> to, to the border, and we are seeing that. Overall, though, I believe it, illegal immigration overall is still not quite as high as it was, say, during the George W. Bush years or within the early Obama years. So one would say, well, what is the real national emergency then? Well, again, you can, you can spin the numbers any way, one can spin the numbers any way they want. The truth of the matter is those are the people they've caught. We know there are far more people that are, that are here than um, with the Bush administration, and the cartels have done a better job of figuring out how to create the diversions. So what's happening is, for example, we know on the Rio Grande, the Rio Grande Valley that the number of family units coming through is up 200%. 50% of those family units are fraudulent. They're not real. So, so that being the case, we also know from the Border Patrol, because their resources are so strained, that the cartels have turned the human trafficking business into a multi-million dollar business. So they'll encourage 100 people and get them to the edge of the border to get them in, in family units. And while that's going on, they know that all the resources that the Border Patrol have have to be concentrated on getting those people arrested, transporting them to processing stations, and so forth and so on. While that's happening, the cartels are bringing in another hundred that nobody's seeing just down from where their diversion is, along with the drugs that they're muling across, because Border Patrol doesn't have the resources. And they're getting five to seven thousand dollars a person on the hundred that are just coming through. So so they've manipulated the system, they know it inside out. The word back 
across the border is, come with a kid, you'll get in, they'll only hold you 20 days, and that's why we're seeing a 200% increase. Where, where, are the, where, where are the reports of a sudden surge of violence in Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador? We know there's, there are issues there. I've talked to people who are from there. There are, there are areas that are very difficult. But where are we seeing the sudden like, report of surge of violence and things that it's required 200% more people to come? We're not. We know what it's about. And the American people, I think, have figured it out. The cartels have turned this into a way to get people to come here so they can make money. So Congress can stop it. The question is, will they ever have the will and the intestinal fortitude to do the right thing for the people that they promised they would protect? Mm -hmm. You mentioned Secretary Nielsen earlier, and in the last week and a half, there have been a lot of immigration related news on the enforcement front. So Secretary Nielsen is stepping down and there have been reports that the president was not happy with her uh, regarding her, her, like, like her, like her hesitation to uh, shut the border or to stop accepting asylum uh, like applicants as, as president before they wanted. There have also been other recent developments such as um, you know, threatening to sh shut the border down totally cutting off aid to those Northern Triangle countries. Um, what are your thoughts on all that? Well, I know Kirsten Nielsen. I've worked with her. Uh, and I, I know that the president thinks an awful lot of her. Um, it's not uncommon in any administration, uh, as things evolve, to want to sometimes change direction, look at new people for various reasons. Um, some of these reports that somehow she wasn't doing her job or she wasn't aggressive enough. And also that the president wanted her to resume the child separation policy. Well, the president actually doesn't want her to resume the child separation policy. In fact, he's the one that stopped it. And, um, but that's his own policy. Well, the, the, the policy that they put in place initially was to separate these kids for their personal safety. Because what was happening is when you, had, when you were putting families in with other families, you had for single mothers, single fathers, or what have you, you might have 20, 30, 40, 100 fathers in there with their kids inside, inside a, a cell. You don't know what's happening to those children while they're inside there by other people who are in there. You don't know if you have pedophiles in there. You have no idea what their backgrounds are. So what happens is you're exposing these kids to potential danger. And until somebody walks through that processing center, they really don't have an understanding about it. But th there's never... There was, I don't think anybody in this country believes that the president says, hey, we're going to punish you by separating you from your children. This was all done in the interest of trying to protect these kids, but the volume has increased so dramatically that it's made it impossible to, to understand and do the, the things that everyone wants to do, which is protect these kids. Uh, you can't fingerprint a child under 14. My recommendation just recently was implement the iris scan at the processing stations. So if a kid's brought in by someone, whether it's their parent or not, it gets taken back to the border after the people get released and sent back across into Mexico and then somebody else, so somebody else can bring them in and say they're a family unit. When that child gets to the processing center, they will know at that point, based on the iris scan, wait a minute, this kid's been through here before. Whereas they didn't have fingerprints to compare uh, by, because they aren't allowed to do fingerprinting. So, you know, it's, look, the president, the president, is not interested, and everybody knows that they've watched what he's been trying to do, which is to correct this problem, keep people safe. He's not going to say, let's, let's punish the people coming through. He said many times, most of the people coming here aren't coming here as criminals. But we also have laws in this country, and he's right to say, we're not going to just say, you can just ignore our laws. And the other people, you people are waiting behind the borders, you're waiting your turn, doing it the right way, respecting the laws of the United States. You just keep on doing that. And don't look over here behind that curtain there in the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to what's going on over there. That's a separate thing and we're just going to let people come through. And to the message to the people who respect our laws, well, respect the laws of the United States don't matter anymore. Do what you want. If you don't feel the laws the way you want it to be, just violate it. And that's where the rubber meets the road. 
That's where my point is about Congress. Congress is allowing this mixed message to happen, the undermining of our laws in this country, which are the framework that protect our democracy and our republic. And that's where we are. But the president, I will tell you, he's, he had full confidence. I've been to many meetings with him, with uh, Kirsten Nielsen. Uh, and I was just at the, my meeting at the border was with Kirsten Nielsen was there. And she's done a phenomenal job bringing partnerships together. But we're at a different place now as far as the president's concerned, based on what I know, what I've heard, that they're looking to try to get this thing to a whole other level with people who are working on the border and uh, have had extensive experience there. Now, on the child separation policy, quote unquote, that was happening because the adults were being were being arrested and prosecuted uh, as felons, with as felony charges. So, like that required the kids to be separated from them. And you said earlier that that was a way to protect the, the to protect the kids. But it seemed to be like more of a byproduct of arresting the parents as criminals. So, was do you really see that as as a way to, to protect the kids to separate them? In the families? Well, let's put it this way. I wouldn't want my kids, uh, if I was arrested as a felon, I wouldn't want my kid being housed for days inside a pen with other felons. Um, because depending on how, how uh, aggressive the others are and how much I can defend me and my kid, um, might, it, might be a problem. But if these are other my families who are just being prosecuted as such, and not violent, then is that a problem? Well, we, we're talking about felons, right? We're talking right. right. The, the policy was to treat the adult migrants who crossed over illegally to, to treat them as felons. If they were felons. No, no, like, I mean, that, that was the policy. Like, that they, they, they were all, they were all, they were, they, they were all arrested as felons. It, it, to be prosecuted as felons. That was the policy. Well, they couldn't be prosecuted as felons for simply coming across the border. There's, the law wouldn't allow for that. There's no way that they could do that. So I don't know where that came from, but but it's a misdemeanor for coming into the country illegally. And if they had felony records, if they were able to determine they were murderers or or you know members of the drug cartel and been tra you know transnational gangs or something and had a record and they could determine that, then they probably separated them. But but I can assure you, I, I look this president. If you ever watch him with kids, if you ever, I've been in meetings where, you know, there was a family that, that lost one of their kids and, and um, one of the sheriffs was there and said, had a letter just to say, thanks for, for trying to fight to make sure no more families have this happen. And he said, give me that letter. We wrote a note, you know, God bless you all. I'm sorry what your family's gone through. That's, that's the president that people don't get a chance to see unless they're in his company and get to know him. They, so, I, honestly, I look. Um, I wasn't a big supporter of at all of, of Barack Obama or his policies. I felt he undermined law enforcement. And most people in law enforcement across the country felt he did do that, and um, he created a lot of this problem that we're seeing. But I, that didn't make me not work with his undersecretary to try to deal with these problems on immigration. So <clears throat> whether I liked the president, the former president's personality or his policies or what have you, uh, wasn't the measure I was looking at. I was looking at what can we do to try to help our people and our communities across this country. And that's why you're seeing sheriffs all over the country rise up. They're done with it. They're done with Congress's inaction and Congress's continual um, efforts to undermine our ability to keep our promise. You know, and I misspoke earlier about violence. I should have said that, that policy, as, as I understood it, was to arrest them and prosecute them. To, as criminals, and that that was what triggered the separation. Well, I don't know that that's the case. I, I, I don't know that was the rationale behind it. My understanding is the rationale was because they didn't want the kids to be in these pens with adults that they couldn't control. And if you've been in the processing centers, you can see there's so many of them, people in these pens. It's, it, it's hard to imagine. I mean, I, we would never be allowed in the United States in our correctional facilities to do that based on the standards. But unfortunately, the Border Patrol doesn't have a choice. They're not given any, any other facilities, they're not given any other options. They got 15 
uh, Border Patrol agents assigned around the clock to hospital details, who otherwise would be out trying to prevent more and more of these people coming through, filling up these processing stations. So, so it's a big, it's a big problem. A big problem. Like wrapping up, just a couple more quick sure. questions. So, um, all yours, right? so as long as you need. All right. Thank you. So, all right, so you mentioned, you know, that Congress has not done its job on this. So, I'm curious, what can Congress do? What should Congress do to address this issue? The first thing Congress should do is to make sure that the, the border security uh, that we've been asking for is funded. They need the wall, they need the, the cyber stuff to, to protect the border and channel people toward um, entry points where we don't have people's manpower spread out for you know, a thousand miles like they do in other countries, um, like they do between Guatemala and Honduras. Um, so there's reasons for that, and we need to make sure that's done first. We also need them to end the lottery, pay attention to who's coming through, have, as we did before, an immigration system that provides opportunity for people that want to come here in a, in a more timely way, and also in a way that's consistent with whatever our infrastructure can handle as more and more people want to come. Um, as I said earlier, if you, how many New Bedfords are sitting idle with total infrastructure waiting for 100,000 people to come in? There isn't. Our communities are designed for growth for more and more people, our country is. But it's a controlled growth because you have to have the infrastructure to be able to support the people. So when the president says our country is full, so what goes to your mind? Because it seems that you're saying that there is room for growth, though it has to be controlled and managed. Well, there is room for growth, but but we're well beyond that now. We're we're they're they're claiming 11 million people. It's cl probably closer to 19, 20 million people that are here. And when you don't when you don't have the infrastructure in place, what happens is our hospital rooms, our emergency rooms become inundated. Uh, the taxpayers are paying all kinds of money to support people that are here, uh, people that have paid in all their lives. And maybe you're now, um, you know, their, their, their spouse passed away and now need public housing. And they've paid taxes all their lives, raised their families, support the churches, civic organizations are told, hey, listen, I'm sorry, you're on a waiting list. Because 20 to 30 percent of the people that are occupying that public housing aren't people that have paid in all their lives. They came here and are here illegally. So, so there's, there, there has to be a responsible way for Congress, if there are more jobs here, as we've done in past history. When there were more jobs, we opened up more immigration. When we didn't have jobs after the war and things like that, the presidents wanted to make sure when the veterans came home that they had jobs for serving their country. So they cut back on the number of people that could, could immigrate during that period of time. So it's, you know, we have, to, we have to do it in a sensible way within the rule of law. And what Congress needs to do is change the laws. You don't like it and you want more people to come, change the law and let more people come. But this idea of just deciding for yourself and making these false arguments and empty arguments that it's, you know, the people that are insisting on the laws be enforced for structure and growth are somehow xenophobes and hate people and are anti-immigrant. It's just a bunch of bunk. It's a way for them to avoid having the spotlight on them to say, you put the laws in place that we're, we're trying to enforce right now, you don't like them, change them. But don't tell me if I took an oath to uphold the laws and promise the people I would in this if I were to get a press release today from the White House announcing that Chef Tommy Hodgson has been appointed acting like Homeland Security Secretary, <laughs> what are some of the first things that you do? Well, the first thing I do is ask you, how, how come you got that, that press release? <laughs> <laughs> that would be my first question. No, um, you know, it's funny. Some, some, uh, I had a sheriff say to me, hey, when he saw some of these changes, say, hey, maybe you're, you, know, you would probably be a great person to go there. But I think, as I've ex expressed many, many times, I remember being asked by Chet Curtis on Channel 5, hey, so you went to Washington, huh? And I said, I went to Washington? I just got back from Washington. This is over a year or so ago. And, 
He said, no, I mean, you were going to go work for the president. I said, actually, I'm not. You wouldn't go work for the president if he asked you? I said, honestly, it isn't because I don't support the president, what he's doing for the, in his job as president. But I believe that the mistake that's always been made is that you take the very people who have their boots on the ground in communities across this nation and you have them fulfill some position somewhere down there and you lose the benefit of getting policies that really do directly impact people in, in our neighborhoods. Because it becomes more of a bureaucratic, bigger sort of policy kind of thing. And when you can have people that are working in the community seeing the impacts on different issues, whether it's the economy, taxes, um, health care, uh, immigration, and tell the specific stories, as the president's gotten from angel moms and dads all over the country, sheriffs, all these people, you get the better chance of when you do create a policy and you're going to really have an impact as opposed to sort of the political kinds of answers that we often get out of Washington sometimes with Congress and so forth that, well, let's make it look like we did something. But more often than not, it generally makes it worse. So I, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Um, my colleagues all over the country, the sheriffs that I work with, they feel like I do. Hey, listen, there's, there, there isn't an office, public office in the land that's more trusted than sheriffs because people don't see us as Democrats or Republicans. They see us as people that are really trying to focus on and have our hands on what's going on in our communities. You know, we have many cities and towns, different issues, different problems, but by and large, we're working with elected officials who know the issues. So we can share that with Washington instead of Washington losing that connection and not being able to get it in a way that would, would benefit all of us. Thanks, Jeff. Final question. A couple of years ago now, uh, you offered to send uh, detainees and inmates from Bristol County to the southern border to help build the wall that the president has been talking about now. And so does, it, does that offer still stand? If it will benefit the taxpayers and um, it makes financial sense, um, obviously we'd send ours, or I, as I said, it should be a national initiative because they're, they're inmates who would want to volunteer. We had two that left when all this was being talked about and being released and said, listen, if you go down there, please get a hold of us, we'd go. And they weren't even going to be here. So, you know, we've, we've learned over the course of time, and I'm a big believer, that whatever way we can utilize our prisons where inmates want to get a life experience, or particularly one on a national initiative, whether it's laying the pipes in Flint, Michigan, to get people cleaner water two years earlier than they could, if it's going to be less expensive and help them, then do it. The people that are doing the work are getting the benefit of feeling like they really gave something back. That many of these individuals who serve time in jail never get those kind of accolades growing up. But now they get a chance to say, hey, I was part of that project. We had it happen here in New Bedford where a guy pointed out to the lighthouse when we refurbished the Butler Flats lighthouse and said, when the mayor of Tierney was in, they were cutting the ribbon and said, you know what, I'm going to be able, when I get out of prison, to bring my son down here, and I'm going to be able to show him that I refurbished that historic lighthouse. And he was as proud as could be. And we built a handicapped accessible treehouse at the IDDI school for resident, residential people who had head injuries. It couldn't be anywhere else. And one of the inmates at the ribbon cutting said, you know, I'm convinced that God sent me back to jail so I could do this project. So when I hear people criticize us for wanting to let inmates do good things for good people, I don't worry about it. If it makes good sense, saves taxpayers money, and it gives them a chance to sort of see life in a different way and get on a better trajectory, I'm there all day long. Well, Chef Hodgson, thank you so much for your time. Like, uh, you've never duck my phone calls or duck my questions. A couple of the tomatoes that. and things that you threw at me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me.